Casey Hayward is gone, but what does this really mean for the Falcons' draft plans at cornerback and safety? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, you know me. I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, and, of course, the very humble host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And we thank everyone that makes this illustrious podcast their first listen each and every day. Make sure you continue to make us your first listen or first watch by subscribing or following for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So later on today's episode, I will be having a conversation with Savion Mixon of Blogging Dirty about some potential safety targets for the Falcons in this upcoming draft due to the expectation, or we actually recorded that shortly the week after the Falcons made the Jeff a coup to trade, but you know, Savion wanted to talk about corners on that episode, but he didn't get that opportunity because the Akuda trade. But maybe if we had Savion back on the podcast, you know, in the last 24 hours, 72 hours, he would be able to talk about cornerback because, of course, the Falcons did cut Casey Hayward over the weekend. This is a move that if you've been listening to Lockdown Falcons for the last three months, we've been speculating off and on that it could happen, right? And that sort of initially stemmed from hearing Arthur Smith get asked a question about Casey Hayward and his progress in his rehab. And it was a less than enthusiastic response from Arthur Smith about that, that to me was the first planting of the seed that maybe the Falcons are not counting on Casey Hayward, uh, you know, being back on this roster in 2023. And then that extended when they hired Ryan Nielsen as their new defensive coordinator in the likelihood and the expectation that the team would move towards a more man heavy scheme. And Hayward has been a cornerback that over the last, you know, the better part of the last decade has specialized in being a zone corner, spending a lot of his time playing under Gus Bradley, uh, not only with the Chargers, the Raiders, uh, for the last five years in that cover three heavy scheme. And I've already seen reports from various people out there that the Colts are already sniffing around Casey Hayward, uh, you know, and Gus Bradley is the current defensive coordinator over there in Indianapolis. And we didn't see that release happen at the outset of free agency like I initially expected it and predicted it to happen back in late January. And then the question was, OK, is Casey Hayward really part of the team's plan? Is this kind of a placeholder? You know, what? what is their kind of plan moving forward? And we kind of went back and forth a bunch. And finally, on Friday, we got kind of our definitive answer, although there's still some speculation out there from folks that because the Falcons cut Casey Hayward with a failed uh, physical designation due to the fact that he hasn't fully recovered from that torn pectoral muscle that he suffered midway through last season uh, limited into six games played. Uh, that he could be back if and when he gets healthy later this summer. Although I would imagine if that was the plan, the Falcons would have just kept him uh, in the meantime uh, in order for that to happen. So we've been talking basically since January of the possibility, if not probability, of the Falcons taking a cornerback at eight um, in this upcoming draft later this week. And I still think that's a possibility, although I think a lot of it depends on how the board falls. And if you listen to yesterday's episode, when I talked about how I expected the board to fall, to me, I don't think it's likely that either of the top two cornerbacks are going to be on the board at eight, that being Devin Witherspoon of Illinois, Christian Gonzalez of Oregon. There's been more buzz in the last 24 hours that you know Witherspoon's probably unlikely to be there. Maybe Gonzalez slides a little bit. We'll see. Um And I think if one of those two guys is there, the Falcons will certainly be very tempted to take one of those players with the eighth overall selection. But again, giving my best guess and, you know, uh, ask me in 72 hours, I might have a a different opinion. But my best guess is I think the Falcons will probably roll with Jeff Okuda atop penciled atop their depth chart. I think they want to draft someone that could potentially push him, but I don't think the Falcons necessarily need to draft somebody in order to push him just because of the circumstances. When you look at the depth chart in the roster, we know that Jeff Okuda has one year left on his contract. So this is kind of a prove it 
contract year for him. And next year he's a free agent. And I don't think the Falcons, even though they only give him a fifth round pick in that trade for Jeff Okuda are see him as a sort of a one year rental. And then they're going to move on from him. Right. I think the Falcons want to believe that Jeff Okuda is a long-term option opposite AJ Tarot as their other starting corner. And I think they'll give him that opportunity to prove that this year. And if he plays well, we will potentially see the Falcons extending him next offseason in addition to the extension that we're expecting A.J. Terrell to get that big money top of the market extension. I don't think we'll see a top of the market deal for Jeff Okuda, even if he has a good season. Uh, we look at a contract like what Jamel Dean signed this past offseason to stay in Tampa Bay, a four year, $52 million deal, averaging $13 million a year to basically be the number two corner in Tampa Bay opposite Carlton Davis. And that's kind of where I see uh, Akuda's potential, Jamel Dean, similar, you know, athletic, physical corner. That's kind of what I think Jeff Akuda has the potential to be one of those high end CB twos in the league. And, you know, if you draft an outside corner, let's say you don't get that guy in round one and you get that guy on, on say round two, because the board doesn't fall a certain way, but you get a guy, you know, at pick 44 in the second round or something like that. And the expectation that that guy's going to come in and, and win a starting job, I don't think should be particularly high just because we know rookies typically do not hit the ground running immediately in the NFL uh, at, at the cornerback position, especially. Um, and so I, I still feel like Jeff Okuda is going to be your best option this year. And if he plays well and you wind up giving him an extension, you've potentially just wasted a second round pick or a third round pick or whatever on a player that's going to presumably ride the bench for, you know, three or more years. And so I do think if the Falcons do wind up picking a cornerback high in this draft, let's say in the first three rounds, that player potentially needs to have outside inside versatility, not only the ability to play outside in the event that Jeff Akuda struggles, but also that ability to play inside in the event that Jeff Akuda plays really well in this, a long-term Falcon. So I think the Falcons are hoping Akuda is going to solve their outside needs at that cornerback position. And so I think they want to find somebody who can, they can slide in and provide that help on the inside at the nickel position, because with D Alford, with Mike Hughes, I don't know if the Falcons are long-term committed to either one of those guys, although we're big fans of D Alford here on the locked on Falcons podcast. So again, I, I think that's another position where the Falcons don't necessarily have to take a guy because they have in internal options, but we'll see. But I did have the Falcons taking a nickel cornerback last year, uh, yesterday uh, in my full seven round mock draft. I had them selecting Keytrail Clark, the Louisville corner, who's played both outside and inside in Louisville. But most people project them due to some of the size issues that he has as primarily an inside corner in the NFL. And that's kind of where my thought process is for the Falcons plan at the cornerback position. We'll see if Terry Fontenot, you know, texts me tomorrow morning says, you know, Aaron, you got this wrong on, on locked on Falcons. You know, it's my first listen each and every day. Uh, here's the real scoop. And, you know, Terry doesn't give me all the inside information ahead of time. He allows me to speculate because he, he likes to play those games with me, but we'll see what Terry's response is later this week uh, to this statement. And we'll see if the Falcons wind up adding that other outside corner in this year's draft. I think with the amount of bodies that they have at the cornerback position with Darren Hall, with Cornell Armstrong, with Jamal Peters, again, none of those guys, you know, singly inspire a whole ton of confidence, uh, but the collective group of those guys, hopefully one of those guys emerges as a capable backup on the outside. And then you also have Mike Hughes as well, that could also be a capable backup on the outside, assuming he doesn't win the starting nickel cornerback spot, because frankly, Mike Hughes's best film in the NFL has been as an outside corner, not as an inside corner. So we could see a scenario where he is the top backup there. But I think the Falcons will have options that they don't necessarily have to address via the draft because there will be veteran options after the draft, presumably. Eli Apple, Trey Flowers, guys that have familiarity with this coaching staff. William Jackson, if he gets healthy. Darius Phillips, Artie Burns, if he gets healthy. Uh, Lamar Jackson, not the quarterback, but the cornerback uh, that played, I believe, with the Bengals. Uh, under this coaching staff or our secondary coach, Bryce Callahan from the, the Bears. 
uh, PJ Williams from the Saints, Shandon Sullivan played with Jerry Gray in Minnesota, Chris Harris, uh, you know, played with the Saints last year. Some of those guys I just named are more nickel options. Uh, you could also look at a player like Fabian Moreau, who's unsigned, who the Falcons had two years ago as their starting outside corner. So I think in the event that cornerback doesn't go the way, way it go, we want it to go, either with the draft and getting that right player, or, you know, if we get to training camp and Akuta's having an up and down camp and Mike Hughes is struggling. I think the Falcons will have some options potentially to add later this summer to sort of shore up this position. So I don't think the Falcons are done at the cornerback position. It just remains to be seen how big a priority it's going to take in the draft. So we'll look at some potential options that the Falcons may be looking at in the draft. Some players that I've identified that I think make a ton of sense, particularly in the top three, four rounds of this draft. And we'll break those down as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. But it is the time for grand slams, no hitters, and double plays. And there is no better place to get in on that MLB action, guys, than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That means you get bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. No sweat. All you got to do is go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up and claim your no sweat first bet. And whether you want to bet the spread, the money line, I love betting a little so that you can win a lot, which is a parlay. And FanDuel has a great parlay builder. So you can combine players in different games. This guy you think is going to hit a homer. This guy's going to hit a get a hit. This guy's going to get an RBI. So, you know, you can feel better about, you know, the Braves coming off a rough weekend against the Astros, but maybe you feel great about them taking down the Marlins later this week. So don't miss your chance for that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. When you join FanDuel today, head to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. So, guys, I want to give a shout out to all my everydayers uh, and, uh, you know, that make Locked on Falcons their first day, first listen every single day. And for those of you tomorrow, I think, you know, we've been we've been delaying this conversation for a while here on the podcast. We've had other people talk about it, but you'll finally get my thoughts on it. Well, you know, let's talk about Bijan and the possibility for him to be the Falcons uh, first round pick uh, potentially on tomorrow's episode. So make sure you continue to make Lockdown Falcons your first listen so you can check that out. But today we're going to talk about the cornerback position and going through the list of players that the Falcons have had draft interest with. Um, you know, a lot of the corners that they've looked at this offseason have been mostly late round guys, undrafted free agent types. For example, they talked to Miles Brooks, the Louisiana Tech corner at the Combine. Um, and Dane Brugler is projecting him as like a sixth or seventh round pick in this draft. They also chalked to um, Michigan cornerback Jamon Green at his pro day at Michigan's pro day. But Brugler has him as the 61st ranked cornerback in the draft. So he's probably a surefire undrafted free agent. They did use a top 30 visit on Syracuse corner Garrett Wilson, Garrett Williams. I'm sorry. But I think that may be owed to the fact that he's coming off an ACL tear. Uh, and so that's a, a situation where they want to get a second look at his medicals, his recovery versus necessarily genuine interest. As I've discussed before on the podcast, like these top 30 visits aren't always about signaling who the team is going to draft. A lot of it is just gathering information about players. And when you look at several of the players that the Falcons have brought in, players like Jalen Carter, players like CJ Stroud, players like Quentin Johnston, you know, these are guys that have question marks surrounding them, um, you know, based off of all the pre-draft hype and stuff like that. But, you know, we know the Falcons love senior bowl guys. So pretty much any senior bowl corner is potentially on their radar. They've drafted 11 senior bowl guys over the last two years. So some names that pop off a guy like Jacorian Bennett out of Maryland. He was an outside corner, but due to his size, I think a lot of people see him potentially projecting inside at that nickel spot. So going back to the conversation we had, but there was a lot of good outside corners at the senior bowl, Darius rush out of South Carolina, Julius Brins out of Kansas state, massive human being uh, as a corner Caillou blue Kelly out of Stanford, Riley Moss out of Iowa. All of these guys are well-versed on the outside that, you know, stood out at various points during the senior bowl practice. And we know the Falcons certainly have some interest in some shrine bowl guys due to their presence. there, coaching the East roster. Uh, they got up close and personal and some of the top rated corners in the shrine bowl that are 
generally seen as like day three guys. You have Keetro Clark of Louisville, who I, I mentioned already that I mocked to the Falcons in round four uh, in my seven round mock draft. You have Starling Thomas, the fifth out of uh, UAB. Terrell Smith out of Minnesota, Trey Tomlinson out of TCU is a very feisty physical nickel specialist. So those guys, some several of those guys could be potentially on the Falcons radar. I'm also scrolling through Dane Brugler's The Beast, uh, you know, and reading some of the blurbs on some of these corners um, just because I haven't necessarily gone deep past like the guys that are projected in, in the top two rounds. Um, and one senior bowl guy that stood out to me based entirely off his blurb was Darrell Luter Jr. out of South Alabama. And Dane Brugler wrote, overall, Luter w- won't be an ideal fit for every scheme, but he is athletic, long, and unfond of receivers who think the catch point belongs to them. He projects as a man coverage corner uh, with the skill set to work inside or outside. And so that last sentence to me is like exactly what the Falcons, you know, going back to what I said earlier with Ryan Nielsen probably leaning a little bit more on man coverage than we have under Dean Bees, you know, the ability the flexibility to play inside or outside Luter Jr. is about six foot 190 pounds uh, with long arms if I'm not mistaken so he fits the the archetype for both a guy that can you know function in the slot but also has enough size to hold out on on the outside and of course you know Arthur Smith loves his receivers that are great at the catch point so you got to imagine he also is a big fan of corners that can win at the catch point so Daryl Luter Jr. another name uh, to keep your eye on for the Falcons but you know I think a lot of people are going to be focused on those early rounds in addition to Christian Gonzalez in the round one and Devin Witherspoon in round one. You know, I think of some several round two corners are potentially going to be on the Falcons radar. A player like Cam Smith out of South Carolina, Clark Phillips out of Utah, DJ Turner uh, out of Michigan. And what's notable is, you know, Cam Smith spent about 30 percent of his snaps this past year in the slot. So he has that inside outside flexibility. Clark Phillips, about 35 percent of his snaps this year played in the slot. DJ Turner, only about 8% of his snaps in the slot, but because he's like 178 pounds, he's often projected by people to be more of a slot corner uh, due to his size limitations, although he's he can fly. He's one of the fastest guys in draft class. But to me, the other thing that stands out that I've touched upon before, and I'll remind you guys, we, we know this regime loves their coaching connections, right? They love drafting players that they're like one or two degrees removed with a, a coach on our staff knows this coach that was coaching that guy in college. Uh, we've seen them draft some of those guys and just a couple of coaching connections that I, I'm aware of. Right. We have several assistant coaches on this roster, uh, on this coaching staff that formerly were at NC State. Right. Dwayne Ledford, the offensive line coach, our assistant offensive line coach and Sean Flaherty. Um, We also have Dave Huxtable, who was a longtime D coordinator at NC State. And of course, Ryan Nielsen, who was the D line coach at NC State. And a couple of NC State coaches have gone on to other places uh, to have success there. And they got a couple of prospects in this draft. Right. You have Clayton White who served under Dave Huxtable alongside Ryan Nielsen at NC State. He is now South Carolina's defensive coordinator. So he's very familiar with Cam Smith and Darius Rush. So, you know, Dave Huxtable or or Ryan Nielsen, give him a call and be like, okay, give us the the scoop on Cam Smith or uh, Darius Rush. You also have Aaron Henry, who coached at NC State as well and is now Illinois' defensive coordinator slash DB coach. So you have that Witherspoon connection. You have three safeties in this draft class from Illinois that are draftable. Right. You have Jatavius, a.k.a. Quan Martin. You have Kendall Smith. You have Sidney Brown. Right. Quan Martin was primarily a slot player this past year. Right. Sixty seven percent of his snaps the past two years, in fact, have been in the slot. Kendall Smith was primarily their deep safety. He was a one year starter projected more as a late round undrafted free agent type of player. But if the Falcons, you know, don't get their safety in the first couple of rounds, he'll probably be on the board potentially for them in round seven. And of course, Sidney Brown was kind of this versatile, you know, you know, Swiss Army knife type of guy primarily spent his time in the box as a safety, but also dabbled as a deep safety, also dabbled in the slot covering tight ends. And speaking of Sidney Brown, our next guest, Savion Mixon, is going to talk about why he thinks Brown makes a ton of sense for the Falcons, as well as several other safeties that have positional flexibility. Like if the Falcons don't get that corner, that can slide in and push for a starting uh, slot job or push Akuda for an outside job. It also makes sense that we know they have a need another body at the safety position. And if that guy has, you know, slot versatility, right? 
it makes a ton of sense for the Falcons, given that, you know, we're probably expecting Nielsen to incorporate more dime looks in the defense, three safeties, three corners, big nickel, which is three safeties and two corners with the nickel look. So we'll get the scoop from Savion Mixon, who covers the Falcons for blogging dirty, as well as the new millennium Falcons podcast coming up. He'll, uh, we also talked with Savion last week about the wide receivers uh, that the Falcons could potentially target. So we'll continue that conversation switching to the defensive side of the ball as we continue today's Locked On Falcons. But I want to tell you guys that today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. And you've heard me talk about how therapy has really benefited me over the past several months. And that is thanks to BetterHelp. Therapy has helped me understand that I can only control the things that I can control. And I can't control whether or not the Falcons draft a player that I like or win a football game on Sundays. But the thing I can control is the quality of this podcast. And I've heard from several of you over the last several months that you think the podcast has gotten significantly better over the past year. And I think you can think somewhat that to better help. And therapy is about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. And better help is going to help connect you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery wherever you are. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, think about giving BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist in only a day or two. And you can then switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if you don't like that match. So discover your potential with BetterHelp by visiting betterhelp.com slash locked on today and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L p.com slash locked on so here with savion mixon of the new millennium falcons podcast contributor of blocking dirty and we just talked about some of the receivers that the falcons could potentially target in the middle rounds savion let's talk a little bit about some of the safeties that you think the falcons should have their eyes on at some point in this 2023 draft so this was originally going to be corners and then the jeff okuda move happened so I was like, okay, kind of got to pivot here, uh, kind of find find somebody that uh, find another position that we could be targeting. But um, yeah, no, we have a good amount of safeties that we can look at. Um, one big name I liked uh, that I saw that actually is coming on a visit to the Atlanta Falcons, Sidney Brown, um, was always in the right place at the right time at Illinois. Uh, he's very physical near the line of scrimmage. Obviously, opportunistic because he what had six interceptions last season. Um, just a huge dude. I mean, he's 5'9", sure, but that dude is a just a rock. I mean, he really is, which makes it that much easier for him to uh, come down come downhill and just be a force in the run game. Um, what was it? The game against Iowa, he showed off his coverage skills against tight end, against uh, Sam Laporta, one of the big, one of the good names in uh, when it comes to tight end. So it's just it, it. He seems like an all-around just really good safety. Of course, there's the size concerns with him being at five nine, but I don't think that should that should stop you from wanting him to be maybe a third safety or a, um, uh, even a nickel if you want him to be, uh, to fill that fill that void. Where do you sort of project a player like Brown to get drafted? Brown is more so a second to third, a fringe third round guy, late second round guy, in my opinion. Um, I think that's the sweet spot of this draft because I don't I don't see us really doing much in the first round unless there's a trade back when it comes to safety. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that, yeah. Uh, this safety class is interesting because you have Brian Branch kind of at the top and mm-hmm. then it's kind of a pick your flavor. And I'll be curious to see how these safeties get taken off the board is there a run on safeties on day two of the draft in that second round that will move some of these guys up that may be projected as middle round guys up the board you know this could also be a draft where some of these guys that are being projected as like second round picks it wouldn't shock me if they like slide in the draft as well because they're uh you know teams are just kind of lukewarm on the safety class and like yeah we'll we'll get our guy later and some of these guys that you know were being projected as like top 50 top 100 picks you know are still there in round five so the safety class is is, is certainly going to be interesting but i certainly think the falcons will have an opportunity to get somebody else in that room uh to add to the three that they already have uh Mm -hmm. to potentially replace eric harris and someone like Sidney brown is very comfortable playing in the box to me makes a ton of sense there 
most definitely. Um, another guy that I love, and this is pure FSU bias, is Jamie Robinson, um, senior bowl standout. Uh, loved his route recognition. Um, made a ton of plays. I mean, he had 99 tackles last season as um, at the safety position. And, I mean, he's Georgia-born, held his own against tight ends, and is just a really instinctive player that I think if you want another, like a third safety type guy, like you said, to replace Eric Harris, I think that'll be another route that we take. Now, uh, I'm curious with, with Jamie Robinson, you know, he's a little undersized, but mm-hmm. kind of had some versatility. Um, could you see him in a similar role that maybe some people thought Chauncey Gardner Johnson could potentially play here in Atlanta as a sort of a hybrid safety nickel type of guy? Does that fit his skill set, or do you feel like he's more of a, a, a pure safety? No, he's definitely more of a versatile guy, like 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 CJ like CJ GJ. Yeah, he, I mean, it just it it just kind of makes sense that he would be slotted into that because his best play is around the um around the the line of scrimmage around the box, but he can also cover those tight ends, cover those um those seams just like you want him to too. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Who else do you have on your list, if anyone? So I have Marte Mapu from Sacramento State. He mm-hmm. came into the senior bowl as a linebacker, but it was obvious to see that he was a little undersized, um, 6'3", 221. Um, and so, I mean, he's a huge, versatile athlete. He has major upside in, in special teams, which I'm sure you would love. Um, but uh, he's also got major upside as a – as another one of those guys, I mean, he's a bit of a project, but he has played corner and he has played um, safety, I think, back, back in high school. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's just a great athlete and a great coverage guy. He understands uh, depth both in the scenes and, you know, in the flats and those types of things. So I just – I think DeMarte would be another guy that we could look at a bit later, uh, maybe around – Maybe around the third, fourth round, maybe a day three guy, but we'll 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 see we'll see about him because I'm I'm very curious about how the NFL looks at him. Now you, you we're talking about him obviously with the, with the safety position. Would he be more of that hybrid safety box linebacker type of role? What what type of role would you envision him here in Atlanta? So him, I think he would be. I don't want to say the same, like, because because I see Caden Ellis and I'm still kind of confused on what he's going to do, like as far as his around his um versatility. So I'm thinking that they're just trying to find versatile guys like that. So I guess he would have to be that that versatile linebacker safety kind of guy, you know, because it's it's obvious that Nielsen doesn't want to pigeonhole guys into one. Sorry about that. Pigeonhole guys into one position here, but. Yeah, I, yeah, I have to say that that safety linebacker type. Okay, so um, now I'm sitting here thinking, you know, th- they did use a lot of dime in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So could he be that sort of dime linebacker, that six defensive back that if you need him to play, you know, a defensive back role, yeah, he could do that. But also, if you need him to drop down in the box to be that extra run thumper to continue to beef up the run, does that make sense for his role? Especially since he played linebacker, most definitely. Okay. Most definitely. All right. So uh, those are a couple of names for the safety position. Uh, Sidney Brown of Illinois, Marte Mapu of Sacramento State. And uh, who was the other person you said? Jamie Robinson. FSU. Jamie Robinson of Florida State. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can never forget three, the note. Yes. Three good names there. Three good options for the Falcons. Certainly, I think safety is one of those positions that they do have a hole at currently with uh, not resigning Eric Harris. And certainly, I think that's something that the Falcons will plan to address in the draft. And we'll just sort of have to see how early, how big a priority that, you know, fulfilling that depth and potentially getting yourself a third safety option, you know, given some concerns about whether Jalen Hawkins is going to be long term here if this is going into I think his contract year. So mm-hmm. um certainly a guy that could be slotted in to replace Eric Harris this year, slotted in to replace Jalen Hawkins next year. And then who knows what that player's role could be down the future. So guys, that's gonna do it for us. I want to thank once again Savion Mixon uh for coming in and sharing his insight into some secondary players. And we'll continue this draft train pre-draft cycle probably talking about B. John Robinson and the possibility 
that he'll be the first pick in the draft and maybe the Falcons trade back in order to get that. That's been the buzz that sort of come out Monday with NFL insiders like Peter King and Albert Breer and whatnot. And so we'll incorporate that into our thought process for the Falcons, potentially on tomorrow's episode. And we also might have Savion back on the show to talk about some running backs. We might have Matt Wallman on the show to talk about some running backs that make sense for the Falcons. If they don't land B John Robinson in round one. So you can expect all of that tomorrow on uh, Locked on Falcons. So continue to make us your first listen. And if you aren't an everydayer, then you got to subscribe or check us out for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're, you know, still gearing up for this draft, guys, you know, not only do you, I have you covered here on Locked on Falcons, but, you know, Keith Sanchez and Damian Parson have you covered on the Locked on NFL Draft Podcast. You can also check out Joe Marino and Kyle Krabs keeping you covered on the Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes podcast. Find them all as part of the Locked On Podcast Network on the same podcast platforms. You listen to Locked On Falcons, your team every day.